Okay. So you have the floor, Toma. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ayman, for the nice presentation. I don't know if uh, there are some uh, philosophy of soap bubbles in the classical history, <laughs> but we can check that. Um, so thank you also for the uh, organizers for the, the invitation and the opportunity to talk about uh, what I do in Hanover. Uh, as you said, uh, with uh, Professor uh, Lynn Heller. So all, um, all this uh, is a joint work with Lynn Heller. And uh, yeah, so the title is Soap Bubble, a Gauge Theory. Um, so maybe you recognize, do you, do you see my pointer on my screen, the pointer? Yes. Okay. Yes. So maybe you recognize this uh, picture on the left uh, from your childhood. Um, so of course, this is a... Uh, these are constant mean curvature surfaces in the Euclidean three space, as every child knows, also called sob bubbles. And uh, maybe if you're into that, you will rec recognize also the, the picture on the right. Uh, so I'm not a specialist, but I just went to Wikipedia and I typed a definition of a Higgs bundle and Higgs field, Higgs boson and so on. And so this is the mathematical definition of a uh, Higgs field. So from, from your perspective, uh, especially because uh, I think there are physicists in the room, uh, so maybe this uh, Higgs field uh, explains uh, how mass appears in our universe. But from my perspective and from today's point of view, it will uh, mostly explain uh, why there are soap bubbles in our universe. And so in my talk today, I, will, I would like uh, first to give you some uh, examples of soap bubbles. And trust me, they are not uh, all trivial. So I will, uh, I will show you exactly what uh, mathematically we, we define as a soap bubble. And I will show you a lot of pictures most of them, nearly all of them, are made by uh, Nick Schmidt in Berlin. Uh, some very nice picture of uh, generalizations of soap bubbles. And I would like, in a, um, after that, I, I would like to, to, to show you the relationship between the two. And I promise you that uh, we will derive from the mathematical equations of soap bubbles, we will go to a Higgs field and a Higgs bundle. And so this is what uh, will be called a gauge theory of uh, soap bubbles. And so <laughs> this may seem a little uh, overcomplicated just to describe uh, soap bubbles, but actually uh, we can start from here and build some uh, mathematical construction uh, starting from there and have a uh, very nice and unified theory of uh, soap bubbles. And you can, with that, uh, construct examples. You can make very nice pictures. So this is what Nick Schmidt does. And actually, you can also prove very deep results uh, about the, the partial differential equations that uh, are behind these uh, sub bubbles. So OK, let's go. Speaking of uh, partial differential equation, this is the first uh, definition that I would like to, to give you. Uh, what I call sub bubbles, actually, you may know it. Uh, it's actually uh, minimal surfaces and more generally constant mean curvature surfaces. And so I will always, always be talking about immersions from M, which is a two dimensional uh, Riemannian manifold, into uh, the Euclidean space, for example. But uh, we'll see that we can go also into the hyperbolic three space or the spherical three space. But so the idea is that the surfaces I talk about are really surfaces, so two dimensional and hyper surfaces in a three dimensional space. Uh, minimal surfaces are defined uh, as the critical points of uh, the area functional. And if you put uh, some constraints uh, for your deformations, if you put the constraint of volume preserving, uh, then the critical points are called CMC surfaces. 
Now the first question is, uh, okay, so what's the what's the relationship with the soap bubbles? Uh, I, I said I would talk about soap bubbles. And the nice point is that um, soap tends to minimize uh, the surface tension. And it turns out that the surface tension is proportional to the area function. So you have a, a natural computer uh, for making uh, minimal surfaces if you have soap. And so uh, it's been studied in chemistry. And for example, this is your first example of a minimal surface. So this has been uh, embedded into a uh, soap and um, along this ring is formed a plane, a planar disk. And this is a, a critical point of the area functional without any volume constraints. So this is a simple example, but you can have some uh, more uh, elaborate examples. So again, with soap, this time uh, having two rings like that, uh, if you embed that in a soap solution, you will get a catenoid, which is also a minimizer and thus a critical point of the area function. And you can play around with that. You can have a, uh, a helicoid. So maybe here we can see it. Yes, so this is a helicoid. So you put the, the spiral uh, into soap and you have this uh, minimal soap. So this is the without pressure constraint. Uh, but if you, if you add a pressure constraint, then you can have some uh, uh, constant mean curvature surfaces. So this guy has the same setup. So here, uh, this is soap. Uh, here is just a, a plastic bottle uh, cut in half. And so he can make a catenoid with that. But because he's He's taken a bottle, uh, he can put uh, pressure in it. And so we can also have model for CMC surfaces. Now, if I add this stipulation, I'm going to add a little pressure to it, to the center here. I can, and then cap it so that air is trapped inside there. I can generate a nice cylindrical salt film. So this is a cylind cylinder, which is a constant mean curvature surface. And it appears because he has blown into the bottle before. So this is a critical point of the area functional with a pressure constraint here, which is equivalent to a volume preserving deformations. And so look what happens when you- It turns out that if I try to stretch it too much, it tends to form like a bowling. So when you stretch it, uh, mm -hmm. the volume constraint uh, does not change but um, the boundary of the surface changes. And so what you get here is another CMC surface, constant mean curvature, which is called a Delaunay surface. So these are all uh, physical models of um, minimal surfaces and constant mean curvature surfaces into the Euclidean three space. These are the solutions of a variational problem. Now, <clears throat> another definition, an equivalent definition of uh, minimal surfaces um, would be using the mean curvature. So maybe I can show you, yes, I have time. I can show you what is the, the mean curvature of a surface. So this will be another definition, which is uh, much more geometric and which does not uh, involve a variational property. So you take a surface uh, like that. This is a piece of surface. You take a, uh, a point on it. So let's take the, the middle point here. And by doing that, uh, you can define the tangent plane uh, of the surface at this point. And you can also define the unit normal uh, of the surface at this point. So every point has a unit normal. You can use this vector this unit normal to define a plane, a cutting plane. And you, could, you can also use this plane in order to define a, uh, a plane section. So you take the intersection of this plane with the surface and you have a nice curve. So this curve goes through P 
and it is a planar curve. So you can measure the curvature of this curve at the point P. But of, of course, you don't have unicity of the choice, and you have many, many curves with many curvatures for each point P. So for example, this has no curvature, this has positive curvature, this has zero curvature, this has negative curvature, and so on. If you take the average of all these values, you have a number which is called the mean curvature of the surface at the point P. So this is now a function which take any point on the surface and give a real number. You can do that for each point. And if this function is uh, zero everywhere, you say that your surface is minimal. And this is a theorem of saying that uh, minimal surfaces in the sense of a variational problem are the same as minimal surfaces in the sense of uh, mean curvature. So <clears throat> using this characterization of what a minimal surface is, you can construct examples. Uh, so we've seen the plane, the first example of a minimal surface. We've seen the catenoid. We've seen the helicoid. And you have uh, many more examples of uh, minimal surfaces. Uh, one very nice example would be the, the Costa surface. Uh, so this is, this is the Costa surface. So uh, this image is, this picture is from uh, Matthias Weber, not from Luc Schmidt. But so this minimal surface is uh, complete. You can extend it uh, to infinity. It has a finite topology, meaning that it has a finite number of handles like that and holes. And it is uh, embedded, which means that it doesn't have any self-intersection. It doesn't cross itself. And this class of surfaces are very important. So first of all, because they are nice to see, no auto intersections and so on. But uh, it's, it's actually very hard to make this kind of uh, surfaces. So for example, I've, uh, I've noted the, the, the dates. Uh, so the plane that dates back to uh, very, very early in human history, of course. Uh, the catenoid was described by Euler in 1776 uh, using the variational property. The helicoid was described uh, 30 years later by Meunier. And the fourth one, satisfying the properties of being complete, embedded, minimal, or finite topology, uh, the fourth one, the Costa surface, has been made 200 years after the helicoid. And in between, there was no example of a complete embedded minimal surface with finite topology. So in 1986, uh, people have shown that uh, the Costa surface was embedded. And this re required two things. The first thing it required was a via Strass representation. So what is the via Strass representation? I've only put the theorem here for uh, reference, but the idea is that it's a recipe starting from uh, meromorphic functions or holomorphic functions. So you, you start from a holomorphic ingredient satisfying a simple property. So here is the property. You have two functions such that f times j squared where it is holomorphic. And starting with these ingredients, you have a recipe which each time will give you a minimal immersion into R3. And the nice point of that, the important point of that, is that you can reverse the construction and any minimal immersion can be locally obtained this way. So if you want to study minimal surfaces, using this via Strass representation, it, it becomes suddenly very simple. You just take uh, a set of ingredients, admissible ingredients, and then boom, you have directly a minimal surface. Sorry, Thomas, for D is uh, this core? Oh, oh yeah, sorry. So D is, um, it, it is a simply connected domain uh, in the complex plane. Yeah, thank you. So this is, this is what I mean when I say that the Weierstrass representation is local. 
So you can you cannot take in general a global uh, Riemann surfaces and have uh, glo global definitions, but at least you can do it uh, locally. So this was the first ingredient for Costa surface, and the second one, uh, the second one actually was uh, uh, computer graphics, because uh, if you have the Weierstrass representation of the Costa surface, it's not sufficient for you to know that it is embedded. And uh, it may be very hard from the ingredients to show that the surface is embedded. And so computer graphics were uh, necessary for the intuition of how to prove that the Costa surface was embedded. OK, so again, the general idea here is that I have a variational problem, many PDEs, a complicated one. And there is Weyer Strauss who says, oh, but Actually, it's easy. You just uh, have to study holomorphic functions. OK, so far, so good for minimal surfaces. Uh, let's go to uh, CMC1 surfaces in R3. So this would be the solution of the variational problem with a volume constraint. CMC means uh, courbure moyenne constant, or uh, constant mean curvature. So the, the definition is self-evident. If, if this uh, mean curvature function is constant, then you have a CMC surface. And the theorem is that uh, um, CMC surfaces in this definition are the same as the variational CMC surfaces. The examples, we've already seen them. You have uh, the unit sphere, which is uh, the classical soap bubble. Uh, we've seen uh, on the video that the cylinder is also a CMC, and you, we've seen also the Delaunay surfaces. So Delaunay surfaces are CMC surfaces, which come uh, in, uh, in a one parameter family from the cylinder to what is called the nodoids. So the nodoids are not embedded. You have these auto intersections here. And they go through uh, onduloids like that. We've seen that on the video. And actually, the sphere is part of the Dolonet family. You see here, you have a, a nice bubble. Here. So these are the classical examples of uh, CMC surfaces in R3. <clears throat> but um, these are not the only examples. And uh, Nick Schmidt, for example, constructed um, a whole bunch of uh, CMC n noids. So we, we call a Dolony end a two noid because it has two, two ends. A Dolony surface has two, two ends, but you can, you, you can make um, CMC n noids. So let, let's see what they look like. These are uh, constant mean curvature one surfaces in R3. So this one, these ones have a planar symmetry, and you see each of the ends resembles a Delaunay end. Uh, this one has a tetrahedral symmetry, a very nice. And uh, you can have uh, platonic symmetries. So again, Nick Schmidt did that. And so you get these very nice pictures here of, uh, of end noids. So this would be a six noid, an eight noid, and so on. Now, the question is, uh, how do you make such nice pictures? And uh, as for the Costa surface, what we would like to have is a kind of a Weierstrass representation, right? And this exists. Uh, there, is a, there is a generalized Weierstrass representation, uh, but instead of making minimal surfaces, it makes constant mean curvature surfaces. And this uh, dates back to Dorfmeister, Pedit, and Wu, which is a, a, a whole method, a whole method called the DPW method. And uh, we, will, we will say a little more about that later. But the idea is that you, you can also uh, cook CMC surfaces with a simple recipe, well, simple enough, uh, from holomorphic data. So it's a little bit more complicated than the Weierstrass representation, but the idea behind is the same. Holomorphic data are the ingredients to make solutions of a variational problem. So <clears throat> these would be the classical uh, soap bubbles, but actually uh, you can leave the Euclidean space and go into uh, some uh, other spaces, three-dimensional spaces, 
And for example, you can go to the hyperbolic three space. And if you go to the hyperbolic three space, it's the, it's the same. You can have the definition of what is a CMC surface. And in 1970, Lawson uh, showed that there is a correspondence between minimal surfaces in Euclidean space on the one side, and on the other side, uh, constant mean curvature h equal one surfaces in the hyperbolic three space. And so this correspondence, uh, so it's uh, for every minimal surface in R3, you have an isometric CMC1 surface in the three-dimensional three space. And so you can, uh, you can try to make uh, examples of uh, CMC1 surfaces in the hyperbolic space. And of course, the first reflex would be to say, oh, I have a Weierstrass representation for minimal surfaces in R3. Can I uh, translate it into a holomorphic representation for CMC1 surfaces in H3? This is exactly what Bryant did uh, with uh, the so-called uh, Bryant representation. So again, I've uh, written here the old theorem, but the idea is that uh, you can obtain CMC1 immersion into the hyperbolic space from holomorphic data. And any such immersion can be obtained this way. And uh, so what, uh, what can we do now? We can uh, take some uh, ingredients, some holomorphic data, and see what, uh, what kind of uh, CMC surface it makes. And you can, again, make very nice pictures of uh, new examples. So this is a conformal model. This is the Poincaré ball model of uh, H3. And uh, Nick Schmidt, for example, did uh, all these uh, very nice pictures of uh, n -noids, CMC1 anoids in uh, H3. Okay. Um, it turns out that this uh, Bryant representation as for the Weierstrass representation can be generalized by this uh, DPW method. And so you can make not only CMC H equals one, but uh, CMC H greater than one with this method. So Euclidean three space, uh, hyperbolic three space, you can also go to the three sphere. Again, Lawson said that uh, you have a, uh, a uh, isometric correspondence between uh, minimal surfaces in S3 and CMC1 surfaces in R3. And you, you, can, you can try to make uh, examples of minimal surfaces in S3. And so that's what Lawson did. He made examples of compact embedded uh, minimal surfaces in S3. So this is uh, the stereographic projection of the three sphere. So this is why you are in, uh, in R3. And so Lawson did uh, these, uh, these nice surfaces. So genus, uh, genus one, genus two, three, four. And actually you have a, a lot of them. For every genus, you can have one of them. Again, these pictures are made by Nick Schmidt uh, in Berlin. And so you may wonder how to make these uh, nice pictures. And again, this is the same story. Uh, but Lawson didn't know, didn't know that at the at the time. But uh, you have a uh, you have a representation, a holomorphic representation of such surfaces, which make it possible to make very nice pictures of them and to study the space of uh, of minimal surfaces in history. And actually, this is the um, this is the historical example of. Uh, of um, how to say that. This is the historical be beginning of the DPW method. And it starts from uh, this remark or this theorem that if you have a minimal surface in S3, you can associate to it a Higgs field. So, so this is a very uh, yeah, gauge theoretic and mathematical physics uh, statement. And I will actually try to, to show you that, that to any minimal surface in S3, you can associate a Higgs field. So I hope you 
know a little bit of uh, gauge theory, but I guess that uh, if there are some physicists in the room, they know that. Uh, actually, it's not, it's not so hard to, uh, to see what happens there. So let me share my, my tablet and we'll do some, uh, some computation, explicit computation. Okay. So do you see my screen? From surfaces to Higgs field? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, okay, let's try that. So let's start with, uh, so my goal is to start from a minimal surface in S3 and to get uh, a Higgs field. I won't give you uh, first the definition of a Higgs field. I think what's important there is to see uh, the way of thinking uh, that uh, Hitchin had. So you have a uh, conformal minimal immersion from M to S3. Think of M as a Riemann surface. So S3 has a, uh, a met metric and by putting back this metric to a oriented two-dimensional Riemannian manifold, you can put a Riemann surface structure on it. It will be important later. So suppose that F is conformal. Then uh, you look at, if you look at the area of F, you will get this formula uh, here, that the integral on M of Tf squared and omega M being the volume form on F. So, Maybe uh, the, the, the PD uh, specialists here recognize that. This is the Dirichlet energy, right? And uh, what is the critical point of a Dirichlet energy? Well, <laughs> these are called uh, harmonic maps. So if F is minimal, then F is a critical point of the real functional, which is the Dirichlet energy here. So F is minimal. And using the Riemann surface structure of M, you can uh, translate that into one uh, simple equation, which is that uh, D star DF equals zero. So what is D here? This is uh, the pullback of the levi civita connection on S3. So this is a um, Hodge theoretic way. So this is the, the Hodge star or more precisely minus the Hodge star. And this is a Hodge theoretic way of saying that uh, F is a harmonic map. So this gives us a link from minimal surfaces in S3 to harmonic maps. Now, uh, I want a, as I said, I want a gauge theory for minimal surfaces. So starting from my uh, harmonic map, if I want a gauge theory, I want some, uh, some Lie group, right? So do you see a Lie group here? Uh, if, you, if you do some physics, you see a Lie group here because S3 is exactly SU2. SU2 being the matrices uh, P, Q, minus Q bar, P bar inside uh, SL2C, right? So uh, if you see S3 uh, inside C2, these would be the, the coordinates of, uh, of the points on the sphere. So this SU2 here is a group G, and this is a compact Lie group. And the theory of Lie groups says that it has a bi-invariant metric. And wh what does that say is just that the levi civita connection uh, of the tangent bundle of G is given by the trivial connection plus uh, one half of the Morer carton form. So this little phi is one half of the Morer carton form in left uh, trivialization. The important part here is that, uh, so from, whoops, 
from M to G, considering the tangent bundle here, you can pull that back to a bundle over M. And if you have here the Levi Civita connection on the right, you have the a pullback connection here, which I will call Nabla. And Nabla is exactly uh, in, uh, in left trivialization given by this formula. So F inverse DF is just the Morer Carton form. You take one half of it, and this gives you the Levi Civita connection in SU2. So now, I would like to call that uh, phi. And I see that as a one form from M to the Lie algebra of G. And the Lie algebra of G here, because G is SU2, you can see that just as uh, matrices in little SU2 like that. Oh, okay, so now you see it, right? Yeah. So this, this is just a one form into little SU2. Okay. <laughs> so again, the story is that I have a minimal immersion F from M to S3, which is SU2. And from that, I have constructed some one form phi over m. Uh, Thomas, sorry, we don't see what you are oh, uh, writing. Yes. OK. So let's uh, da -da, that. Do you see it? OK, yes. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. Hmm. So the story is you start from the minimal map. You, we have cooked together uh, one form in little SU2. And little SU2 is uh, just a SU of some uh, vector bundle here. And what is this bundle? It's just uh, the trivial bundle M cross C2. So all the, all, yeah. So now you can see this little phi as a connection one form of, uh, so this is a connection one form of some bundle uh, V, which is just a trivial bundle. So of some connection on V. And so in the canonical trivialization, uh, Nabla again is given by D plus phi. And little phi is uh, still uh, one half of uh, F inverse DF. So I hope you will see it in a few seconds. Huh. Okay. So you don't see it, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, it's okay. And so the idea now is to remember the harmonic map equation on F. What does that say? What does that say to us about phi? And again, you can you can compute it. I will not do that. But um, the fact that F is harmonic means that d uh, nabla phi is zero. And you remember that phi is given by the morer carton form. And so you have uh, integrability conditions, morer carton equations. And so morer carton equations gives you, uh, sorry, this is star. And morer carton equations give you the integrability condition on phi. So let me just wait a little bit so that it's, uh, It refreshes. So the idea is that um, harmonic map equations can be translated into equations on this uh, one form. So I'm hoping that it will work. <laughs> and the two equations are just uh, d of phi is 0 and d star phi is 0. Okay, uh, does that work? No, it doesn't work, right? Um, <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so just let me. I'm just trying to reconnect how it will work. If not, it's okay. Okay. Yeah. Now, remember that I said that M had a Riemann surface structure. And so uh, this, little, this little phi here being a one form on M to SU2, uh, you can split this one form into a uh, DZ part and into a DZ bar part. So again, it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> Okay, and the the idea behind it. So I will stop. Uh, I will stop trying to trying to. We can see to right here. Uh, we can see now. You can. Uh, okay. 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 I guess you are at the end, so you can finish this. Part. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. You split that into dz and dz bar, and because it's in little s u two, you have a big phi here minus the adjoint of it. And you can do the same for the connection for the exterior covariant derivative of the connection. You can split it into the linear part of the connection and the anti-linear part of the connection. And this is a way of defining some vector bundle V, uh, some del bar operator on it, and some one form, one zero form, which takes value into the endomorphisms of V. And if you do the computation, you will see that first of all, uh, this del bar is a holomorphic structure on V, which is a complex vector bundle. And that's this big phi is holomorphic with respect to this structure. And this is uh, the definition of what is a Higgs bundle. So the classical Higgs, uh, Higgs field and Higgs bundle satisfy these equations. And we, we can construct such a Higgs bundle uh, from a minimal map. And let me say that this big phi is called the Higgs field. Uh, OK, so I'll stop here because uh, we don't see anything more. After that. OK, so conformal minimal immersion, uh, you get a harmonic map. You identify S3 with a compact Lie group. Uh, you look at one half of F inverse DF, which is a connection form. And then you construct from that uh, V, a complex vector bundle, del bar, which is a holomorphic st structure on it, and phi, which is holomorphic with respect to del bar. Uh, this is a Higgs bundle with phi being a Higgs field. So this was the, 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 the first part of the story behind this uh, generalized Bayer-Schwarz representation that I told you about. And if you, if you know this theory from, uh, from a mathematical physics perspective, um, you, you may know that this is uh, uh, often closely related to what, it's call, what is called the integrable systems. And actually, you can prove that uh, these equations for uh, minimal surfaces in S3, uh, they have the behavior of an integrable system. So if I write my, uh, my connection again like that, so this is the little phi that I was talking about. And this is just the pullback of the levi civita connection. Uh, I can insert in it some parameter which I call the lambda, and cook another connection, which is just defined by that. I take lambda, a non-zero complex number, and I define another co connection like that. And I call this lambda a spectral parameter. If you study the properties of this uh, nabla lambda, you will see that, uh, first of all, it is flat for every lambda, which means that the curvature of this connection vanishes. And it has the three following properties. So first of all, uh, Nabla has a simple pole at lambda equals zero, 
Yes, it's given by this big phi here. And this big phi is nilpotent. You can compute that. Secondly, if you take lambda uh, of, um, of norm one, then this is a unitary connection. Uh, again, you do the computation, it will give you that. And thirdly, at lambda equals one or minus one, uh, the two connections, nabla of one and nabla minus one, are trivial connections. And nice the nice point is that uh, any such family of connections, so satisfying the three properties here, uh, they will give a conformal minimal immersion. So you can go from a conformal minimal immersion to S3 to this family of flat connections. And you can do the reverse from a minimal immersion, cooking this kind of uh, family. Now the question is, and this is the point of the DPW method, how can we construct these uh, complicated objects? And there is a Weierstrass representation from, for that, which is the theorem of DPW, Dorfmeister, Pedit, and Wu. This is a method, a recipe from uh, holomorphic ingredients, you can cook such families of flat connections. And there is a simple formula, once you have this family of flat connections, there is a simple formula which gives you back the conformal minimal immersion. And let me, let me stress the fact that uh, this was the beginning of the story. And it turns out that this DPW method can actually be generalized to uh, constant uh, mean curvature surfaces in S3, uh, CMC1 surfaces in R3, uh, CMC H greater than one surfaces in H3. So many class of CMC surfaces can actually be cooked with exactly the same recipe and, this, and, uh, and more precisely, exactly the same ingredients. So, in this little exercise, there, there is all my holomorphic ingredients uh, making it possible to cook uh, surfaces, CMC surfaces. And so this has been done, uh, taking some uh, ingredients, holomorphic ingredients to make surfaces. And actually what you, what you can do now is start from uh, the ingredients giving you some uh, classical CMC surfaces. And you, could, you can put a little uh, geometric uh, analysis point of view in there and try to perturb the ingredients so that when you apply the recipe, you will have a perturbation of a well-known surface. And this is a, a way of uh, doing new surfaces with this uh, DPW method uh, by perturbing the holomorphic data. So for example, uh, Tresse, so my PhD advisor in Tour, uh, constructed uh, genus zero, CMCH equal one, uh, N noids for any number of N uh, of Ns in R3. But these ones are not symmetric like the one uh, uh, that Nick Schmidt uh, made pictures of earlier. Uh, you can apply the, the same methods uh, to, to, to make a CMC1, uh, H greater than one surfaces in H3. Uh, recently, it has also been done to uh, perturb the Lawson surfaces that we have seen earlier into a, a smooth one parameter family of CMC H surfaces. And let me stress that. Uh, these surfaces were not uh, known before. And actually there are not many examples of uh, CMC surfaces in uh, S3. Uh, another thing to mention is that uh, you see here in the theorem, uh, the surfaces are said to be embedded. And so this shows that you can follow the geometry uh, inside the recipe and you can say something about the surface. Uh, as for the Costa example, Using this generalized Weierstrass representation, you can say things about the surface. And one very nice point uh, recently, uh, again by uh, Lynn Heller, Sebastian Heller, and Martin Treze, and with the participation of uh, Stephen Charlton, 
uh, you can actually compute the area of uh, loss on surfaces. And <laughs> it's surprising, but uh, so loss on surfaces are minimal surfaces, which means that they are critical points of the area functional, but nearly nothing is known about their area. So it's a, it's a very profound result to be able to compute some estimates of, uh, of the area of loss on surfaces. So this G here is the genus of the loss on surfaces. Uh, you saw that they come in families of uh, different various genera. And uh, as the genus tends to infinity, uh, you can have an estimate of uh, the area. And this, uh, this little term here, zeta of three, is uh, really the, the Riemann zeta function. So uh, yes, it appears in the, in the area estimate of loss on surfaces. Uh, I cannot enter into the details of the proofs and so on, but let me end by saying that all these examples and all these results are made using an implicit function theorem argument on the ingredients of the method. And you know that the implicit function theorem only works around uh, locally around one solution. So it's a natural question to, to, to ask uh, uh, what is the maximal time interval of existence and so on. And so actually this is, uh, this is one, uh, one work in progress with uh, Lynn Heller and I to make the, the other end of this uh, CMCH family. So starting from the loss on surface, Heller, Heller and Treze managed to shrink the handles, uh, but the implicit function theorem only says to you that you can go to some maximal time. So what we would like to do with uh, Lynn Heller is to start from here, which is just a, a perturbation of a, a double plane and try to go in this direction in order to, to, to have knowledge of the whole family and to see, uh, to say things about the area of uh, loss on surfaces. And uh, maybe uh, we, can, we can then uh, prove some, some conjectures like the, the Kirstner conjecture um, which is a conjecture about the, 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 the critical, critical points of uh, the area functional in some uh, fixed topological class of surfaces. But I will, uh, I will stop there and uh, thank you for, for your attention. Thank you, Thomas, for uh, your talk with the beautiful uh, illustrations and so on. And yeah, so these are, these are all made by uh, Nick Schmidt in, uh, in Berlin. Again, let me, let me say that. <laughs> okay. You did give the credit enough, I think, for the video. And <laughs> uh, so uh, if you have a questions, uh, you can just uh, open your mic and is there any question? So if not, I can I can show you a neat uh, neat uh, thing. <laughs> hmm? If there are no questions, I can show you some uh, some uh, some some neat uh, behavior of uh, of surfaces. I I don't know uh, as you wish. Uh. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have one question, and then okay, you okay, can so show us maybe. The, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, actually, it was a general question about the um, the holomorphic uh, data in the in the initial Vestras theorem. Mm -hmm. It was uh, on functions, and then the other uh, the other uh, correspondence was like some uh, the holomorphic uh, the data are on one forms. Yes. I yeah, yeah I, I just uh, I would just want if you can comment about this. Uh, yeah, idea. so uh, it's it's just uh, so you, you can express the classical Weierstrass representation not by using functions but by using uh, one function and one uh, one form. You see, mm. 
is the, the, the Weierstrass formula is an integration. And what do you integrate? You, you don't, in geometry, you don't in, uh, compute the integral of functions. That doesn't have sense. You compute the integral of, uh, of forms. Yeah, OK. And so for, with the function f, if you multiply it by uh, dw, you have locally a one form. So you integrate one, one form. And it's, it's the same with the, the general dpw method. Uh, locally, you, you can express that with uh, holomorphic functions. But um, this gauge theoretic point of view asks ask you to, to take a little step back and to see the real geometry uh, behind it. And so the, 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 the bundles at stake and the connections. And so it's easier to deal with uh, one forms than, uh, than locally with uh, functions. And uh, the other uh, question is uh, on uh, the locality. And uh, you have said at the end, I'm not sure if I understood what you mean, but uh, by, OK, you have said something about uh, implicit theorem that uh, this gives um, like the, the surfaces are constructed through uh, the implicit theorem, which is uh, works locally around uh -huh. uh, um, critical points. Um, and also uh, in the all in the in the Vicious theorem there is uh, this locality. Uh, and I want just to know if what you mean is that uh, you try to do something uh, global or what's the uh, yeah yeah sorry yes like, so it was it was not uh, not not very clear. So mm. The DPW method is local in the on the Riemann surface M. Okay, so if you want to construct, uh, for example, compact examples uh, with uh, some uh, topology with holes and handles, uh, or even if you want to do end, then uh, you have to go from local to global, right? And you have to be sure that uh, you can extend the construction globally. And this is, this is a problem which is called the monodromy problem. And this is this equation that is solved with the implicit function theorem. And so there are two localities here. So one is that the DPW method is local uh, for the parameter, uh, for the, the point on your surface. But you also know that the implicit function theorem should uh, construct families uh, with a time parameter, and this is also local. You cannot say that uh, you can extend the implicit function oh. theorem okay, for okay. every value of your parameter. So what I mean is that starting from a well-known uh, ingredient, you perturb it with some ansatz, and then you say, okay, uh, can I apply the implicit function theorem to solve these uh, monodromy equations? And if I do that, then x is given as a function of t, but uh, the existence of, uh, so there is a maximal interval, right? And so it, it can happen that you cannot go too far in the family. So this is the second locality uh, that I talked about. Okay. And uh, the perspective is to uh, solve which locality, or oh, not solve, uh, to extend uh, on which locality, the locality of of time? Yeah, so the project here is that, uh, so there was a first implicit function theorem to go from here in this direction. So the first locality is solved here. The monodromy problem is solved. Mm -hmm. The surface closes itself. Uh, but uh, in, in, you, in order to have the complete family in whole generality, uh, you may want to uh, start here because this is only experimental. This is not a, this is not a, a mathematical uh, uh, proof, but you want to start here and use the same technique, but to go in the other direction. And we think it's possible, and we are trying to, we are doing that. Uh, thank you for answering. I think uh, that's all for me. And uh, 
Maybe you can show us what what, uh, what did you want to... Uh, yeah. Okay, so if it's, it's been an hour, but okay, maybe just... We started five minutes later, so... Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you can have four minutes. <laughs> so um, I showed you this area estimate here, and I said to you that the genus goes to infinity. And I say to you that uh, this is done with the implicit function theorem. Uh, but uh, if we do that, so you, you would have to start an infinite genus in order to have this estimate. So what did they do? Uh, so Lynn Heller, Sebastian Heller, Martin Treze. Uh, when you look at the loss on surfaces, yeah. So I will increase the genus on loss on surfaces. So genus one, genus two, three, four, five, six. So let's say that this is close to infinite genus. So you see that uh, the genus just concentrate here. Now I will apply an isometry of S3. Don't be afraid. This is, this is an isometry in S3. And when, well, when you have that, so let's see if I can show, yeah. So this is, this is just an isometry applied. And I can do the same. You see, I can start from the genus one, two, three, four, five, six. And you can, uh, you can see that if the genus goes to infinity, you just have an infinite number of holes here. And so if you zoom in in S3, you uh, the, the sectional curvature which ch will change and locally this is R3. And what you get, if you look at the, this behavior, what you, what you get should be a minimal surface in R3. And it's actually uh, this surface here. So you see, it's, it's the same. It's the limit behavior here. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And so starting from the DPW ingredients, uh, giving you that, you can get that with a very high genus. So this is what, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's extended in both the directions. Yes, what, what yes, you yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the illustrations are actually, uh, yeah. Even if we don't understand all the details, but uh, <laughs> they are somehow uh, interesting and beautiful. And, yeah, so if there are some uh, integrable systems uh, here, um, so mathematical physics, uh, I would be glad to, to, to talk uh, with you about all that. I'm not sure if it is. Oh, just send me an email. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so thank you, Thomas, again. And uh, thank you for, uh, for all the uh, people connecting with us today. And uh, I so, just uh, ask something. Yeah, go ahead. Mm. Uh, what does the name of the platonic surface comes from? Uh, oh, platonic. Yeah, uh, mm. it, it comes from the, the 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 platonic the platonic solid, you know, and the platonic symmetries. Mm. You know that uh, you have only uh, five regular. Uh, polyhedra in uh, in the Euclidean space, which are the tetrahedron, the cube, uh, icosahedron, and I uh, always forgot what, what are the last two. And so these yeah. have these have symmetries, and the mm -hmm. platonic anoids have the same group of symmetries as uh, these uh, these platon platonic solids, the solids of Platon. Okay. Does that answer your question or? Yeah, just, okay. Maybe I thought that maybe there is a philosophical explanation <laughs> behind <my> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, oh, okay. he, he, he did not do only, uh, only philosophy, but also mathematics. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Latin, so yeah. I see. Uh... So uh, let us call it a day, and uh, we will have uh, another talk in two weeks. So I hope uh, we see you again, and uh, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.